This is Changeling the Podcast. Greetings, changelings and changelingen. This is Puka coming at you with a special mini-sode in which I will be talking about the German-only supplement Trolle Träume Tiefer Walde for Changeling 2nd Edition. This was written by Goethe Heinrich and released by the company Feder und Schwert in 1999 under license from White Wolf. They published a few other German books, I believe for Changeling it was only the 1st edition core book, the Book of Storyteller's Secrets, and the Immortal Eyes trilogy of supplements. So this book has no English equivalent, and I'm putting my rudimentary German to use to kind of give you a surface level description. In terms of applicability for the C20 line, this is where we got the Wichtel and the Wopletinger, and a few other pieces that we've seen elsewhere, such as in Fool's Luck Way of the Commoner. So it is an 88 page book, and I will be flying through it with as much speed as this mini soda allows. So the book opens with a Martin Luther King quote, I have a dream. And then it talks about the importance of sagas and legends in Germany since the Middle Ages, such as the Nibelungenlied, folk stories, Grimm's fairy tales, etc. Very few of which will actually be making an appearance. And it's very much set in its time. It talks a lot about the current state of things in Germany at the end of the 20th century. It does mention the she's return but also points out the sort of commonerism of germany consistent with the lore unlike mont de tenebre france which i also did a minisode on and it says that the kithane of germany are very patriotic although it's unclear whether they're talking about like germany as a nation here or the galatian confederation which is said to kind of correspond to central and eastern europe in c20 chapter one is a summary of history and geography which is probably the richest part of the book there's an acknowledgement that there is considerable banality in Germany, given its industrial and modern nature, but there are enough places of wilderness and folk memory that give glamour to keep the Cathane alive. And this is kind of a theme that the book returns to over and over, focusing on natural spaces rather than like the culture of cities. As a brief historical rundown, the Fey of the region didn't really have the concept of kingdoms until the Romans barged in. Then in the Middle Ages, feudalism spread to the region, along with a system of courts, which switched between Sili and Unsili every six months. The book points to the year 1100 as the point when religion and the tension between temporal and spiritual power really began to constrain the Fey. Then the Black Death brought the shattering when the Shi left their realms in charge of their faithful servants. But then it also says the Renaissance was the final break between the world and Arcadia, so I'm not quite sure what that discrepancy is here. Regardless, the Thirty Years' War frayed relations between the Cathane and Germany, and many of them emigrated across the Atlantic. The rise of absolutism changed little for the situation of those who stayed behind, but they established alliances between their realms, and then the French Revolution came along, which had more of an impact on Sealy versus Unsealy, since there wasn't really a, a nobility at the time. The sense I get from this is that the commoner kingdoms were quite strong entities, which particularly makes sense in the context of the Holy Roman Empire at the time, where you had dozens to hundreds of little individual principalities kind of conflicting. And I wish we had more information about this in other parts of the world. For example, before Concordia was established, we get hints of kingdoms that existed before, but no concrete information. After the fall of Napoleon, until World War I, there was an unprecedented period of peace that allowed the flowering of glamour through Romanticism but also banality spread through industrialization. And then World War I caused many of the Cathane to flee into the wilderness and protect themselves from mortals, potentially becoming lost ones of a type. But their self-imposed isolation and weirdness then caused them to be targeted by the Nazi regime. By the end of World War II, fully half of them had been lost to banality and many of the rest went mad. The book notes that the region was basically without magic from 1945 to 1960. The Cathane returned in the 1960s, remembering their vow to maintain the realms for the absent Shi, and especially satyrs and puka channeled the hippie movement's glamour to rebuild their realms just in time for the resurgence. The Shi were shocked that the recently reawakened commoners, who had just spent a decade rebuilding their realms, didn't want to hand them over. This led to the Five Years' War, which is the 
uh, Accordance War equivalent, it was masked by student protests in the West, and it ended in the Xi admitting defeat. There was some compromise. Turin in particular is mentioned as a region where compromise kind of took hold. And then reunification of Germany gave the Kitain the confidence to move back into the long banal cities. Eventually, this created the 15 domains of the regions that still exist and roughly correspond to the federal Länder or states of Germany. So I'm going to just briefly flip through these, skipping over a lot of the historical, geographic, and political details. Four of these are highlighted in C20, but C20 provides very little information, and so they're very differently presented here. We start with the Bavarian League, which is ruled by a council. There's a de facto high chancellor, in this case a Bagen, but then it's a Seder prime minister in C20. Lots of political jockeying within the council, and the region is very traditional, but a close second in traditionalism is the Duchy of Württemberg. There are lots of decentralized motleys in this one. It seems most of the leaders have minor titles. There's a note about the region having many helpful nymphs in the wild places. Near that is the Margraviate of Baden, a cosmopolitan border region that's more tolerant of the Xi, perhaps because it neighbors Neustria, the French realm, which is noble-dominated. Then Kopfalz, also known as the Electoral Palatinate, is a rural and spiritual region that harkens back to older times. The city of Mainz is ruled by a Puka council, and there are lots of glades in the forests, many of them populated by Nevers, a little-seen chimerical, not-quite-kith. There's the Rheinhessen to the south, lots of natural areas that could use some phase protection. The author in particular points to the Westerwald forest having a long-standing natural glamour that's mostly fallen to banality. Court life is dominated by the city of Trier and a cedar leader who sees himself as a descendant of ancient Rome. There are Cathayne mayors, ministers, and celebrities in many of these smaller towns. Again, there's a reference to nobles and titles, but it's unclear if these are she or commoner nobles. The state of Hesse is nearly lost to urbanized banality, and the troll leader has put out a call for help, which Concordian Gwydianshi are answering. And then in the Thuringian Saxon Union, the East German history meant that the courts had to work together to survive in the under the eye of the Stasi and the secret police of the time. So there's no seely or unseely conflict, and we'll get back to that in Appendix 2. But the city of Leipzig is still an unseely melting pot, there are lots of inanime, particularly gloom statues, but not many glades. It does, however, have a rich cultural heritage, in particular in the city of Dresden. The free state of Westphalia had been ruled by a commodore accommodating Dougal Duke, but then a revolt of upstart knockers in 1996 turned it into a commoner council-ruled realm based in Aachen. It seems like a lot of the other Kithane aren't too keen with this coup in its aftermath as well. Then the Elbian Protectorate has a tradition of seafaring and trade, such as with the Hanseatic League, and story sharing, which makes it a good place for issue. The state of Anhalt is a former knocker paradise of manufacturing and mining, but it was shattered by the banality of coal mining under the East German regime. The region of Brandenburg surrounds Berlin, but the city is off limits because it's controlled by vampires, as seen in the supplement Berlin by Night for Vampire the Masquerade. So the Kithane are largely in the smaller towns. It's a melancholy mix of innovation and stagnation, glamour and banality. It does also note that there are 50 motleys in the region, and I'm flagging this for later demographic analysis in terms of fey population. The section on the Pomeranian alliance on the northern shore focuses on how the formerly united realm was split between Germany and Poland after World War II, and then further undermined by, again, banality in East Germany. This book takes a very pro-West, anti-East German stance, historically speaking. The region is now a refuge for the persecuted, including displaced Xi. The Duchy of Mecklenburg, on the other hand, came out of the Cold War the best because it was too beautiful to destroy. However, there are Dante in the mix here. Lastly, we get the counties of Holstein and Schleswig. The first is very tied to the sea with lots of environmentalism. Hamburg is the center of glamour, and the latter is very rich with glamour and glades along the border with Denmark. There are then some overall notes on the Cathane of Germany. We're told they're generally happier with their homeland than Concordian ones to the point that even the issue rarely leave and go traveling. In terms of how each kith differs, or, or doesn't, Boggins are pretty much the same. There aren't many issue, and it kind of points to the issue being a general dream of the other or dream of a foreigner in relation to wherever they land. So here it kind of points to specific minority ethnicities such as Turkish, Roma, Italian, and Albanian, which have visibility in Germany. The knockers are pretty much the same. 
There aren't many puka, but they're usually dog, hare, or cat, some wolf, fox, and horse ones. There are a surprisingly large number of red caps who all like to hang out in groups. 99 out of 100 satyrs is a wilder. Many of them hang out in nightclubs, so I'm just imagining the famous nightclubs of Berlin like Burgheim populated by satyrs. She are mostly outsiders and can only be aristocrats in a few communities. Many end up as hermits. Slua have a centuries-old reputation of respect as memorious seers and are well-treated. They also dress colorfully and elegantly, unlike their somber Victorian counterparts across the sea. And then the trolls are similar to elsewhere. They're kind of a warrior class that are accepted by almost all other commoners and they're driven by a sense of duty. There's also a note that there are various sorts of inanime and dryads as separate things in Germany, along with many types of gale not found elsewhere. This brings us to the Volpertinger. They're presented here as a mix of human women and turkeys or pheasants, sometimes other animals too, with simple minds. They were hunted in the past by humans for their tasty meat and by changelings for the natural glades that they deplete by living there. They're moody and easily angered. Really, they're more chimera here, and in C20 we get the note that they've only recently become a full-on changeling kith. They have a nature manipulation charm as well. Then the Vichtel, meanwhile, are not given any stats at all. They're just kind of described as a type of earth fae who came to the surface when mining began. They're small, dressed in gray, and only want to be left in peace under the earth. They dislike life above ground, and if attacked, will retreat underground where they can divert water or even magma to their defense. Generally pretty grumpy when encountered. So not much information here, and I can see why they changed these in C20. They're not really playable. There's no birthright, there's no frailty, there's no indication that they have a kind of a, a human connection. So then we get to chapter two, which is titled Es war einmal, the German equivalent of Once Upon a Time. The opening talks about the legacy of folklore in Germany, and then the chapter is a reframing of various tales through a changeling lens. Each one starts with either a poem or a song or a traditional tale. I'm not going to go through the details of each, both because you can look at most of them on Wikipedia, and I will provide links in the notes to this episode, and because they also get very deep, to the point of talking about like the ages of random mortal characters involved and the years in which things took place, etc. But each one does also have some brief mechanics or chronicle suggestions for how to incorporate them. First up is the Lorelei, and she is a famous siren who dwells at a rock along a bend in the Rhine River. She's represented here as kind of a satyr lost one who abides in this little domain. Any Cathane who stumbles into it might fall under her influence, which can lead to glamour fluctuations, being filled with the desire for revenge and hatred, uh, etc. I'd cast her more as an Undine myself, but I'm glad she's in here because she's one of the better known German legends. Not far from her rock is the Devil's Stone. According to legend, a group of monks tricked the devil into helping them build their monastery. When they consecrated it, he realized he'd been had and tried to hurl a boulder at the building, but God made it too soft to handle, so he sat on it in anger and left butt marks. The book recasts the story with a satyr and a puka involved, which makes me think that satyrs fit well for all of those tales where the quote-unquote devil pops up. It's better than trying to work infernalism into Changeling for the first time. Anyway, there's a story hook for them. I'm not sure if the next one, The Warrior from the Forest, is based on an actual fairy tale or not, but I'm not familiar with it. The book says it's a Celtic story that came to Germany from Normandy. There's a warrior named Ernstor who meets a fey lady and gets enchanted by her. He swears to defend the forest from 30 giants who he fights to the death. He lies in a barrow in a forest outside of Nuremberg where the characters, following the story hook, can visit and apparently get sucked back to the year 950. So you can get your Dark Ages game ready here. Then the ghosts of Castle Falkenstein, which I assume this is a send up to the role playing game of the same name. There are lots of Falkensteins, but I'm guessing this is the one in Bavaria due to that game and clues in the text. This one was a ruin that was intended to be rebuilt by King Ludwig II of Bavaria, who famously built castles including Neuschwanstein along the German Swiss border, but he never got around to it. Like the Devil's Stone myth, the ghosts here are suggested to be Fey, who are annoyed that their forest was being cut down for castle building, so they drove the responsible party, Ludwig, mad. Then the Linden of Puch is a tree in Bavaria renowned for being the place where a beautiful 14th century princess fled to live after her father died and she was being pressured into marriage. The book says that her historicity is uncertain, but what is certain is that a 1,000 year old dryad lives in the tree and is knowledgeable about many things that may interest Cathane. 
The saga of Tannhäuser is a bit better known and forms the basis for a Wagner opera, kind of the German parallel to the story of True Thomas, where a knight finds the domain of Venus under a mountain. Here she's cast as a Liam she named Meirid, and it's funny how like all of these she have Irish names, even though they're in Germany. Anyway, he abides there for a year, engaging in song contests and having parties. He returns to Earth and seeks forgiveness from the Pope for his pagan ways, and then the Pope turns him away, so he returns and lives out his days among the Cithane. The book's suggestion is that he might still be alive, providing another True Thomas analog. Then, The Lights of Lüneburg Heath, which were mentioned briefly in Chapter 1, but the heath is a moorland south of Hamburg, with marshes and woods kind of mixed together. It has the same kind of spoopy ghost light stuff that you get in windswept gothic uncanny literature and such. But here, the book introduces a new type of what they call galene, and these are the luminesca, basically will-o'-the-wisps. Like the Wolpertinger and the Victor, they seem more like chimera than galene to me. The book says they're very territorial, resenting trespassers and all uses of magic or other chimera. From the ballads that are provided, it seems like they like to mess with mortals, too. Interestingly, they're unaffected by Sovereign, and then the book lists some possible ways that changelings might encounter them. Lastly, Rubedal is a figure from the Sudetes Mountains along the border with the Czech Republic and Poland. He's often cast in folklore as a fey prince or noble giant who's fascinated by humanity, but here, if I'm reading this right, He's a troll lost one who was abandoned by his beloved liege in the Shattering, so he has kind of a split personality between his Seely and Unseely sides or something. I'm not exactly clear on the details, but he's the only character in here who gets uh, statistics. Overall, these tales are very Bavaria-focused, which, if I understand correctly, is actually the source for a lot of the classic folklore and fairy tales. Still, it would have been cool to see the Erlkönig or the Pied Piper or any of the grim characters who are better known or something. Then in chapter 3, we get into the prodigals. We're told that besides Berlin, vampires are especially dominant in Frankfurt, Dusseldorf, and Hanover, which drives up the banality in those places, and also that there's a Tremier Chantry at the Brocken, a dangerous place for Cithane to go. This mountain, quite near which I briefly lived when I lived in Germany, is famously associated with witches and dark pagan rites and stuff. The book also suggests using the Book of Storyteller Secrets for rules of prodigal and changeling interaction, so that's great. There are few Garou in Germany, we're told, and they rarely interact with the Fey, with the exception of the Fianna. Mostly, they form temporary alliances that fall apart as soon as the Garou go out of control. So then we get the German Order of the Purifying Flame of St. George, which is exactly as gross as it sounds. Basically a group of right-wing hunters who formed in response to the Cithane involving themselves in mortal affairs back in the 19th century. There are about 500 total through the country, all with fairly high banality. They favor arson attacks and violence. Obviously, use with discretion if you plan to include them in your game. Then there's the Weishaupt report. This was a report that uncovered evidence of the Cathane to the German Secret Service in the late 1970s. At first, they thought it was some kind of political organization of monarchists, but then, after foiling a kidnapping in 1988, which was actually an awakening bargain that the other Fae were trying to rescue, they witnessed some supernatural powers and somehow remembered the incident? I'm not sure why the myths didn't kick in, but now they're basically FBI hunters. At least that's more palatable than the last group. And then finally we get the Wiesbadener Institute for Clinical Psychology. This is the German equivalent of Dr. Stark and his merry band of Dantain. In this case the doctor is Friedrich Bachmann. Notably, there's a drug in here called mensaclin that's basically injected banality. A fae who gets a dose of it can't use arts and realms and must roll willpower to avoid gaining banality. After three days of continual dosing, they start losing dots of permanent glamour, which seems quite steep, but okay. So then, chapter four gives us four domains to examine. Again, I'm not going to get into the deep political details, and in part I suspect these might be, as we saw with the French book, the characters and settings of groups that the writer was involved with in their games, and in part because they're kind of what you would expect from a standard uh, region write-up. First, there's the barony of Mannheim, ruled by Benedict, a she of House Fiona, despite the commoner primacy of the region. He's supported by his right-hand woman, Aisha, a Turkish Ishu. There's also Catherine, the slew of grump court sorcerer, and both of them are Fiona Sworn. So it seems that the commoners are still happy to ally themselves with houses. We also have Michael and Unseelie Dougal, which is admittedly a rare combination, and the child of a soldier stationed in Germany. Alex, the Unseelie Fiona Puka Jester. Podrig, the Fiona She Master of Nature. He's got sick amounts of primal magic. And Fred, the Seelie Redcap Knight Errant. 
by this point in my read, I wasn't delving as deep into the explanatory notes of like why there are so many nobles, but I assume because they're mostly Fiona, they get some more leeway from recalcitrant commoners. There is also a note that with the Knock Revolt in 1996, they had to kind of adapt to the times. On the other hand, the Barony of Mainz is led by Torsten, a Liam-affiliated Puka who's taken the title Primus rather than Baron or whatever else. There's also Stephanie, an Eilinid manipulatrix, and Jorgos, the satyr grump chronicler. He has Glamour 9 of banality too, and I'm like, whew, watch out for Bedlam guy. I'm also noticing in these stat blocks that backgrounds are curiously absent, so you can't actually tell who has, like, what level of title. Oh well. Then, the People's High Council of Aachen is the seat of the commoner council that rules Westphalia, and which came out of that Knocker Revolt of 96. There's some deeper political background for how that happened, but more usefully, the mechanics of how the council functions. As a sidebar to that, Josh and I talked about in one of our recent recordings, and with Pete Woodworth in our discussion of the Shining Host Player's Guide, about how it would be useful to have rules for political systems that are both standard and alternative like this one. Anyway, it's got Karl, the Knocker Chairman, and Jochen, the Bagen Chancellor of Aachen itself. Finally, there's the Dark Rose of Leipzig, which comes across as a shadow court cell, kind of? It explains that in the aftermath of World War II, the Fae were inspired by the historical White Rose, a nonviolent student resistance movement in Nazi Germany, to form what they called the Silver Rose to maintain glamour. But then, when the Shi returned, the Silver Rose took a long time to stand up to the Shi reasserting their dominance, so many disgruntled Fae founded the Dark Rose as a counter-movement. They had less success than they liked in West Germany, so they moved to East Germany in the 80s as part of Kithane resistance to the Stasi. I will admit that the backstory here kind of makes me want to run an atomic blonde-inspired 1980s Germany chronicle someday. And I say Shadow Court kind of, in part because we have a sidebar with the Codex of the Four Tenets for the Dark Rose. There is no honor, love is power, which is much more of a seduce your enemies kind of thing, Hatred is life, never give your word. So, like, I'm not sure if this is leaning into left-wing extremist tropes, but again, handle with care, I guess. Anyway, the two members listed here are Sasha, an unseelie Fiona who leads this cell on the sly, and Achim, the troll warlord. That brings us to Chapter 5, a sample story entitled Shadow of Decay. Spoopy. It's a full-on Shadow Court chronicle set around Mannheim, and so draws on the storyteller characters from Chapter 4, and it starts off by giving us some info about the Shadow Court in Germany. They're rather different because their goal is apparently to kill all the mortals in order to preserve glamour, on top of which any Kithane who stand in their way have to be eliminated first. I would say this seems unsustainable, but maybe it's contextualized a bit by the repeated mention of the glades throughout the region. I guess those could give enough glamour to survive or something. But I also forgive the author because they didn't have a Shadow Court book to draw from. The theme of the story is the pain of loneliness and the power of dreams, and I'm thinking, isn't that just changeling? The mood is dark and eerie, no kidding, with a bit of comedy. The scene opens at a light-hearted summer garden party at the Mannheim court with a number of suggestions for side scenes, my favorite of which is Apuka hiding a chimerical crab inside a troll's armor, until the Baron arrives to introduce himself to the new guests, the players. He doesn't get very far before a kraken chimera breaks into the scene and wreaks some havoc. There's fighting, of course, and afterward the usual, what does it all mean, kind of story hook. The slew of mystic proclaims a great darkness arising, and then the characters are sent out into the city on a chimera hunt. They meet a so-called oracle who gives them info. Spoiler, the villain is a shadow court puka with a cold iron rapier, etc, etc. I'll admit that my German reading brain pretty much had tapped out by this point, so I don't think I can fairly assess the quality of the story here, but it is what I'd call a standard changeling story to some extent. I think this is fine for a published supplement, because you need to keep it at least somewhat basic for the new player or casual reader, but I do question the characterization of the Shadow Court. Anyway, the tropes are pretty much as expected. Lastly, we get two appendices. The first is short but useful. It's about getting Concordian Kithane into a German chronicle. This text acknowledges that going from the core book, most characters will probably be Concordian, but they don't need to be recreated. It's simply important to remember some cultural differences. Some options they provide for getting a Concordian character to Germany include diplomacy, they could be emissaries from High King David or whomever, following the trail of a mystery, or perhaps they made friends with the German Fae at one point who offers them a standing invitation to visit, and then to escape trouble at home, they take him up on that invitation and flee from their usual setting. The appendix then goes into more detail about language barriers and differences in laws with emphasis on weaponry, in particular firearms. 
it also says that firearms is much more likely to be possessed as a skill in Concordia than in Germany, given the strict controls, and vice versa for languages. The language system has an interesting piece. So it says that when two characters who don't speak the same language interact, roll their linguistic scores combined against a difficulty of six through nine. And that can range from a simple self-introduction to instructions on building something complex. A failure leads to a misunderstanding and a botch, presumably a severe misunderstanding. Obviously, this would have to be changed for C20 since there's no longer a linguistic skill. And if I ever get around to writing World of Darkness Linguistics for the Storyteller's Vault, I will be bearing this in mind. But it's an interesting system for handling those interactions. And then Appendix 2 returns to the idea from Chapter 1 that changelings in Thuringen aren't divided between Seelie and Unseelie. Basically, the legacies exist in constant combination rather than being complementary, and there's a table outlining which combinations are okay, forbidden, or unstable, in which case you would start with one less banality and one less willpower, therefore closer to bedlam. It's an interesting idea, but I don't know if I'd actually want to play with this. The book then ends with two more random chronicle ideas for some reason. I'm not sure why they're here, but they have the hook of a Freehold's lore book being stolen or the characters being court heralds. I think it might be contextualizing these specifically for Thuringian Kithane, but I'm not sure. And then there's an ad for Guide to the Sabbat at the end and a back cover with a cool eagle glass icon. So overall, I'm sure this was very useful for players in Germany at the time, but I don't know how much it adds to the setting as a whole. I suppose it can provide a template for other region books, but I'm left uncertain about how these Fey are unique. Although granted, I'm doing a translation skim as an outsider, so maybe I'm just not picking up on it. Maybe more useful is the framework for taking a very local legend to the point of a story belonging to like a single village, and then crafting an entire changeling story around it, which seems to be the idea for most of these. The legends that were covered in here are sort of B-list. They don't have the universal recognition of Snow White or anything, but they're rarely so obscure that you wouldn't be able to find anything on them. Although I would have still dug the Pied Piper or lesser known Grim Tales popping up, or like the Musicians of Bremen as Puka, for example. The focus on nature in Bavaria in particular didn't leave much room to explore things like the artistic history of Germany and its relationship with glamour, cultural heritage. I remember going to the Green Vault in Dresden before the Jewel Heist a few years ago, and it was incredibly glamorous looking at all those treasures. There are distinct events like Christmas markets to talk about. Industrialization and its relationship to banality is mentioned, but only in passing. I guess I should remember that because it's only 88 pages and geared towards an audience that could fill in those gaps themselves, it wasn't going to get very deep. I'd say it's interesting as a historical artifact, especially for the Volpatinga and the Wichtel, but beyond that, I'm not going to say this is a must-have for anyone but a completionist collector, which I absolutely am. That being said, I am reading off a PDF right now, and special thanks to Sandshigger for helping provide the text. So that's pretty much it. There are a couple questions from the Discord. Eric Hillian asks, in their original versions, German language fairy stories tend to have a mood and a set of themes that differ from their English or Gaelic language counterparts. How do the authors evoke this style using changeling, whose lore often overlooks Germanic elements? If I had to point to something in particular, I'd say they're less epic and less tied to nobility than the British tales often are. Those elements are still there, but there's more focus on natural and local places of interest, more ideological than the sort of abstract social narratives that you get elsewhere. It would have been possible to lean into those more with sagas like the Nibelungenlied or fairy tales that focus on princes and princesses, but they opted for more of the commoner level folklore, I guess in keeping with how the region is presented in Changeling. Getting more granular about the tropes, I wouldn't say the book really leans into distinctive Germanic ones either. It's a changeling book first, and authentic to the spirit of the tales of the region second. And then Andrew Goodman asks, Is there any more lore or expansion on the Trollkith as implied from the title? I really loved the concept of the Victor and Volpertinger, but their entries were so short in C20. Is there much more to them that didn't get translated? And do the famous Grimm brothers make an appearance? Basically no to all three. The Victor and Volpertinger have a little bit more, but they're so different that I don't think the info is really useful, and while the Grimms are mentioned, it's only in passing. I also really don't know why trolls are name-checked in the title, because they're not any more prevalent than the other kiths. So, thanks for submitting questions, and thank you all for listening, as I have gone through this book in, I won't quite say forensic detail, but enough to at least record this minisode. I hope it edifies you and gives you a little bit more appreciation for the wonderful wide world of Changeling. With that... Take care, und wenn sie nicht gestorben sind, dann leben sie noch heute.